please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God has richly blessed us. He has demonstrated his fatherly love by giving us more than we can possibly ask for or imagine. That is why we are here today. We gather as his dear children by faith to worship and praise him. It's only fitting then that we begin by humbly confessing our sins to our dear father and asking for his continued goodness. Dear father, how it pains me to say it. Forgive me my sins. I am a sinner. That is what I am by nature. And I have proven it again this week with my thoughts, words, and actions. I deserve to be doomed to an eternal night of suffering in hell. But Jesus has invited me to ask for your full and free pardon. So trusting in his invitation, give me the favor he alone deserves. Give me the forgiveness he has promised. Give me what his cross alone has earned for me. Father has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ he has removed your guilt forever and you are his own dear child may God give you the strength to live according to his will Let us pray. Lord, God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment. 
Keep us steadfast in true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'd invite and encourage any children with us today to come forward for a special children's message. How's everybody doing today? Good. Thank you for coming up. We'll give our, pay our, give our ears to, to God's word here. Uh, as we begin today, I want to read you a passage from God's word. Okay? And we're going to hear this in a minute, but I'm going to read it to you first. It says, When the Son of Man, so that's a special name for Jesus, when Jesus comes in his glory, he will sit on his glorious throne. In all nations, all people will be gathered before him and listen to what he's going to do. He will separate the people one from another just like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So he's going to separate people like a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. So do you think you know the difference between a sheep and a goat? Could, could you think you could tell the difference between a sheep and a goat? Seems pretty easy, doesn't it? So I'm going to put it to the test. You think you're so good. I've got some pictures for you, and I want you to tell me which one are sheep and which one are goats. So the pictures are going to be up on the screen, okay? So can you see the screen? Some of those are sheep, and some of those are goats. Which one? Let's start with the top one, the top left. You think that's a sheep or a goat? A sheep. Looks like a little baby sheep, huh? And what about the one with the horns on the right? What do you think that one is? Those are good guesses. That's actually what I guessed, too. But you know what? It's actually the opposite. Those are different kind of sheep than what we're used to. So the one on the right is a special kind of sheep, and the one on the left is a baby goat. Should we move on to the next one? Or now you're not so confident, are you? <laughs> How about the middle one on the left? What do you think that one is? How many say sheep? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah, that's a sheep. Yep, you got it. So the one on the right is a... Goat. All right. Last one on the bottom, on the left. The one with the bell. You think that's a sheep or a goat? <laughs> now you're scared. I'm sorry. <laughs> the one on the left is a sheep, and the one on the right is another goat. It's not so easy, is it? Yeah. I was trying to trick you, wasn't I? That's not nice, is it? Here's my point with that, right? What did we say? Why am I talking about this? Because we said Jesus is going to judge people at the end of the time and he's going to separate them sheep from goats and we think oh that's easy right what it's talking about is the sheep are another name for people who believe in him who trust in him right jesus is our good shepherd and we're his sheep we're his little lambs and so he's going to gather his sheep with him and then he's going to send away the goats the people who don't trust in him the people who rejected him are, are, are the goats and we think, well, that's pretty easy, right? To, to judge between those who believe and trust in him and those who don't, right? But what's interesting, and you're going to hear this in a minute, as Jesus talks about people's lives, it's not so easy. Everybody does some good things. Everybody does some bad things, right? And so if everybody kind of looks the same, if everybody kind of does good things and everybody does bad things, how is he going to judge us? What's... What's the point? How's he going to tell the difference between a believer, a sheep, and an unbeliever, a goat? You know what the difference is? It's all about our faith, our connection to Jesus. Yes, we do good things, and yes, we do bad things, but if we're connected to Jesus, what happens to all of our bad things? Okay, because Jesus died for our sins, didn't he? Jesus took all the bad things that we do, 
He took all of our sins on himself and he died on the cross. And so what he was doing on that cross is suffering punishment. The punishment that I deserve for my sins and the punishment that we all deserve, but Jesus got it. And instead of getting punishment, what do we get? Heaven, right? And so that's the difference in what we're talking about today when we're talking about Jesus judging us. What he is judging us is he's looking at faith. Do we trust in what he has done for us? And when we can look at Jesus and the cross and say, that's my savior, that's my good shepherd, he's the one who died for me, then we don't have to worry about anything on judgment day. He's going to say, you, my little lambs, come into heaven with me because I died for you. Amen. Thank you for coming up here. You may go back to your seats. It's a lot more common and a lot easier to say what many people say. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you really believe it and are really sincere about it. Right? You've heard that before. That may be true to what people think here on earth, but it's not true to what God says. And God is the judge. And we hear that in, in, in God's word today, that when either we die, we have our own personal judgment, or when Jesus comes back, we'll have that final great judgment. It won't be based upon what you thought was right or wrong. It will be based upon what God knew and saw and judged about your life and my life. And those who tried to ignore or reject God's judgments here on earth, they won't be able to escape it then. And they'll have to live with that judgment for all eternity. But... Those, like Pastor said to our children here just briefly, those who receive Jesus as their Savior have nothing to fear on that day because God looks at you and his judgment is true when he says, you're saved by my son Jesus. His love saved you. That's what we read in Malachi chapter 4 here. Surely the day is coming, talking about judgment day, it will burn like a furnace all the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day is coming, will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked and, and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. And this is his word. Let's join together, brothers and sisters, in responding to God's word and his grace by speaking Psalm 90 together today. We'll sing the refrains and speak the words responsibly. have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world from the everlasting to the everlasting you are God. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. You have set our iniquities before you our secret sins in the light of your presence. You turn mortals back to dust the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain our heart of wisdom. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad.
how can I be sure, be absolutely sure that I'm going to be welcomed and even embraced by God when I die and not rejected and punished? Well, it has everything, absolutely everything to do with Jesus. Remember all those Old Testament rituals and sacrifices where the sheep and the goats were, were slaughtered? Those are all pictures of what took place once for all time and all people when God sent his own son to be slaughtered so that you and I would be saved, the whole world would be saved. And Jesus, after he died and rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and stands there 24 hours a day on your behalf as a living reminder to God the judge that your sin has been paid for. That God will never ask another, uh, a sec- demand a second price for your sins. Jesus paid it once for all. And we see that in our second reading from Hebrews chapter 9. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The word of God. Hallelujah. Therefore, for you do not know on what day, watch therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Hallelujah. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. These words will serve as our sermon text today from Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus gives us just a glimpse of what Judgment Day will bring for you and me and for the whole world. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed and, and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Well, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We sing of where our hope is built for today and for eternity, and then our next song together.
Grace and peace to you from him who was and who is and who is to come, our Savior Jesus. Amen. God's word that we want to focus on is the gospel lesson that we just heard. Uh, We will be rereading that throughout the sermon today from Matthew chapter 25. Now that the the temperatures are are falling and, and other stuff is falling as well, we're really entering a pretty entertaining season. You realize that, right? And now you can turn your, your TVs on at like 5 and 10, pop a bowl of popcorn, and just watch the drama unfold. Because we're entering what I call the winter weather prediction season. And I think this is very entertaining because uh, I love to watch all of the, the meteorologists on the network really try to grab your attention when those storms are coming. You know, you'll listen to the forecast and their, their voices get louder and faster and higher and their, their gestures become more animated and the, the graphics on the green screen become more cluttered. And before you know it, they're throwing out inches like, like it's candy at a parade, right? 3 to 5, 7 to 10, 15 to 20 inches, right? With, pretty soon it's this snowmageddon with blowing and, and, and drifting and, and arctic plunges. I just find it very entertaining, very entertaining to watch each meteorologist outdo the other, especially when you wake up the next day looking for this big snow day and you take your broom and you can sweep away the snow, (laughs) right? It's entertaining. But the point is that that's part of the gig, isn't it? If you are going to be in the business of predicting the future, well, then all that drama just comes with the cubicle. Right? And, and so does really the, the target that's painted on your back for us to be able to throw all the jokes at them when they fail. That's just what happens when you try to predict the future. All that said, that's to tell you that I get it. Okay? I understand perfectly what Pastor Zimpleman and I have set ourselves up for today. Okay? Because you walk into church today and, and you hear, what Sunday of the church year is it? Well, it's Last Judgment Sunday. And then you look in the, in the bulletin and we're singing songs with names like, The Day is Surely Drawing Near. And we got this sermon series, Heaven and Hell, and the first one is Hell is Real. So I, I get it. You walk in here and it's, it's just like the drama of the meteorologist, but even worse, right? Even, even intensified, I would say. And so I know there's a target on our back that people would love to laugh this off. This is just another prediction, right? You're making a prediction that this world is going to end, that Jesus is going to come back, he's going to give a judgment to everybody, either up or down. I get it. I get it completely. That eye-rolling kind of reaction is based on your very real experience up to this point. These kinds of things, this this prediction about the last day, it's been going on for thousands of years. People put together these wild formulas based on all the fantastical pictures in Revelation. People set exact times and exact dates, and all the while the sun rises, and then it sets, and it rises again, and we go about our ordinary lives the same as we have for years and years and years. And so based on your experience, that eye-rolling and the laughter is valid. If just experience were the indicator, then yeah, we'd be being very dramatic and and foolish today to talk about this kind of stuff. But I guess I would like for a little while this morning to look at this whole discussion from a different angle. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to set aside your experience. That's not going to be the main factor today. Because I'm not going to give you any wild formulas. I'm not going to point to any signs. And I'm not going to give you any dates. What I'm going to set before you today is simple, are, are simple words spoken by a real man. They're recorded for us in an original source historical document. The words of Jesus of Nazareth, recorded by one of his first-hand followers named Matthew. And and I want to take a look at those words, so I'm going to ask you to open your ears, open your minds, and open your hearts, and let's, let's take a look at 
the last day through, through that lens for just a minute. So the first words that I really want you to look at are these. The beginning of our text in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. It's true. I can laugh off setting dates, and I, and I can laugh off theories about maybe comets smashing into the earth to cause an Armageddon. I can laugh those, those things off, but if I'm honest, and, and if you're honest, it's really hard to brush aside the basic truth of these words in front of us. The basic truth that all people are going to face judgment at one time. That's really what he's saying here when he says he will separate people one from another as a, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. It's hard to deny that, isn't it? And, and here's why it's hard to deny that. Just, just use common sense. Think about your experience. And I said to set that aside, but um, just think about the things that you feel. Why is it that we will almost put our arm out of joint to pat ourselves on the back when we do something good? And on the other side, why is it that our hearts feel heavy if we do something bad? In other words, why do we automatically evaluate our thoughts and our words and our actions and then instinctively either feel good about them or bad about them? Why is that? It's because there is something deep inside of us that has to acknowledge that, that these words are true, that we are accountable. We will face judgment. That's what that voice inside of us is telling us. And so if we acknowledge that to be true, then, then it does us well to continue to listen to what else these words have to say about judgment. And so the next words I want you to, to listen to are, are these. When the judgment comes, there's two sides. We're going to look at one side first. And, and to some, to some, the judge will say this, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. You notice, the first thing you want to notice are the actions. Right? That, that's really what sticks out in our minds and to our eyes, the, the actions. But, but I want you to notice something else. Do you notice how many times Jesus says something like, you did nothing or you did not do this? I think if you don't focus on the actions and you focus on those words, it gives you a clue on what our judgment is based. It's not based on the actions themselves. And if you think about it, it can't be. Because everybody, at one time or another, helps somebody, encourages somebody, loves somebody, right? So it's not the actions. Our judgment is not based on the actions themselves. Instead, our judgment is based on to whom our actions are connected. That's the point of this. It's not the actions. It's based on to whom you and your actions are connected. So with that thinking in mind, take a look at the words again. In this whole section, what is Jesus saying these actions are connected to? It's definitely not to Jesus, is it? So if, if a person is, is neglecting to do good things for somebody else, if a person does bad things, what are the actions connected to? they connected to self? Serving self? Being selfish? And you could flip that around and the same is true. Why is it very often that we do good things? It's because, well, we like to feel good about ourselves. We like to look good to other people, right? When actions are connected not to Jesus, but to ourselves, that's what brings upon this judgment. No connection to Jesus, only connection to ourself, and the judgment is not pretty. Depart from me. Depart from me, you 
who are cursed. I can see why we want to laugh it off. I can see why we might want to try to deny it because it's easier than, than looking at the fact that judgment will come and one of the possibilities of judgment is departing from God. Can you even fathom being apart from God? Can you fathom existence without God? Apart from the one who is light. Apart from the one who gives all things, all gifts. Apart from the one who protects. Apart from the one who, who keeps all things in order so that we have life as we know it. Apart from the one who is love. Apart from God, you don't have any good thing. And that's literally what hell is. Separation from God. Hell is real. And, and this is maybe a little aside, but I want to point this out. I think what makes it even worse is this phrase right here. The fact that God never intended people, his created human beings, to be in hell. That was never the intention. That place was prepared for the vilest offender of all, Satan and his rebellious angels. Not people. That shouldn't have never been an option. But these words give us a very stark wake-up call that the fact is it, it is an option for people when actions are connected only to self, not to Jesus. So let's just review, okay? Let's review what these words have said. Not based on evidence, but based on these words, we can't deny the fact that we feel guilt from time to time, right? And if that's true, why is that? That, mu that means we have to acknowledge that we are accountable to someone. And if we acknowledge that we are accountable, then we also have to acknowledge that there must be judgment, that accountability comes eventually. And if we acknowledge that, then we have to acknowledge that there is the possibility of punishment. And so that's what I was saying. It sounds dramatic. But what we're talking about today is not just a weather prediction. It's not a future prediction. This is a fact. There will come a time when Jesus will say to some, go away from me. Go away to that place that was never even prepared for you. That's one side of the judgment, and, and I wanted to look at that first. And, but there is another side of the judgment. And that's what I want to spend the rest of the time looking at. Okay, let's look at the other side. There's something else going to happen on Judgment Day that you and I are going to look forward to very much. I, I often wonder about people who are in the business of predicting the future. If, if we are always joking about them, and if they, they make mistakes often enough, why do they keep doing it? Why, why, what gives them the courage to get on the air night after night? I think it's because they have all this technology and equipment, right? And it gives them a lot of accurate information. And when they have the accurate information, that accurate information gives them confidence. And so the same could be asked of, of you and me. Why in the world would you have a Sunday like this? Why would you talk about judgment? And why would you invite people to come and actually hear about this? Why are you going to talk about this kind of stuff? Wouldn't it be better to just kind of... <clears throat> Shove it aside, enjoy life while you can, and then see what happens. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a whole lot easier? Well, yeah. But the fact is, we have something that gives us accurate information, too. We have the scriptures. And when we have accurate information about Judgment Day, then we can talk about it with confidence, too. So let's take a look at what that confidence is. The next words I want you to look at... <laughs> are these. To some, the judge will say this, come, you who are blessed by my father, and it, come by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was, uh, I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. As we look at these words, I just want to go back really quickly to what I said just a few minutes ago. Remember, the judgment 
is not based on what you do. It's not based on actions. It can't be because it's the same list for both people, right? And they're both wondering, wait a minute, when did we do these things? It's not based on actions because every single person before the judge on, on judgment could they, they could say, wait a minute, Jesus, I was nice sometimes. I visited people. I, I gave. Yeah, everybody could say that. But judgment is not based on actions. Remember what it's based on? It's based on to whom you are connected. Who are you connected to? So with that in mind, look at the difference in this list. You notice throughout this how many times Jesus uses a word to refer to himself? <coughs> Me. I. Not just in the words printed on the screen, but the whole text. I did the counting for you. 32 times. 32 times he talks about being connected to him. And that makes all the difference in the world. Everybody can do the actions, but what makes a difference on Judgment Day is are you connected to Jesus? That's eventually what he says. Am I connected to Jesus? He says, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Judgment is all about are you connected to Jesus? And do you see what that connection to Jesus is? Is do you, do you see why the connection to Jesus is so important? It's the whole reason Jesus came to this earth. Jesus came to take the place of every single person, of you and me. And while he was living in our place, look at all the things that he did. He did the whole list perfectly. He, he fed people. He fed 5,000 people at one time. He gave somebody to drink. He, he gave a, a drink of living water to the woman, at the, the Samaritan woman at the well. He didn't just visit the sick. He healed the sick. Think about the story of the ten, ten lepers. He didn't just visit somebody in prison. He, he gave a message of hope and encouragement to John the Baptist when he was in prison. Jesus did all of these things perfectly while he was living on your behalf. So think about what that means. If you are connected to Jesus by faith, you are connected to all of his works. All of his perfect works become yours. And that's what the Bible says. I'm found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own. It's not my own actions that I offer God on Judgment Day. What do I offer? I offer that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness, the, the right works that come from God. Those are yours because you're connected to Jesus. You see what else a connection to Jesus means for you? Jesus knows exactly what he's talking about in these words. That punishment, the judgment, you know why he knows it? He suffered it. While Jesus was taking your place, he also took on your sins. All the evil actions, all the good that you failed to do, he took it on himself. And so he suffered for all of it. He suffered the emotional weight of guilt, and he suffered the, the physical pain of, of bleeding and dying. He suffered the, the spiritual hell of being separated from God. And he took it and he, he destroyed it all by rising from the grave. So when you're connected to Jesus by faith, you are connected then to Jesus' death and resurrection. When, when you stand before the judge on the last day, he won't even see any sin on you because God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Maybe dramatic, but do you see why we have a day like this every year? It's to give us confidence we don't have to, to look at these things like, like we're watching the weatherman talking about an Arctic front coming in from Canada and going, oh boy, here we go again. No, these words help us to look at Judgment Day completely differently. These words help remind us that we can look at it with confidence because we are connected to Jesus. And that's my ending encouragement is to remind you, you are connected to Jesus. You're connected to him by faith. You're connected to him through your baptism. 
where he wrapped his robe of righteousness around you. You're connected to him through the promises in the Bible. You're connected to him through his promises in, in the sacrament, the Holy Communion. Jesus is your righteousness, and he's your forgiveness. He's your savior. He's your life. This isn't just a prediction. This is a fact. Okay, the day will come when Jesus will say to some, when Jesus will say to you, come. Come to that place that I have prepared for you. Next week, we're going to continue this sermon series, and we're going to focus on that very place, the place of heaven that Jesus has prepared for you with his death and resurrection. I invite you to come next week and hear about that place, and, and until that time, stay connected. Stay connected to Jesus through his word and sacrament. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that passes all of our understanding will guard to keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's now join together in confessing our Christian faith, and we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed to do that. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This time we have the opportunity to show our thanks and love for the salvation that we have through Jesus uh, by bringing him our offerings. During the offering, I invite each of you to sign the friendship registers that, it, that are in the pews.
Well, at this time in our worship service, we have the very unique joy and privilege of welcoming, through profession of faith, uh, a new couple into our congregation, into our church family here, Carlisle and Kristen Olson. So we'd invite you to come up at this time. Your members of St. John's Lutheran Church, um, Carlisle and Kristen Olson, having been baptized and also instructed and uh, confessed uh, agreement in the teachings of God's Word, uh, they desire to become members of this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus, uh, our Savior promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him here on earth. And you've come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. And do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you believe that the teachings of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned and discussed with us in meetings, uh, as faithful and true to the word of God? Uh, if so, answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the Christian faith and be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, your time, your talents and offerings the work our Lord Jesus has given this congregation if so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Well, having heard your promises, we, the members of St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, and we invite you to share in all our worship and mission here in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Carlisle, welcome. Kristen, welcome. Glad to have you with us here. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you joined these brothers and sisters in Christ to you when they were born again through water and the Spirit. In mercy you taught them your saving truth and we ask that you grant them the ability and the willfulness to offer themselves as living sacrifices to you as their spiritual act of worship. Transform them by the renewing of their minds so that they will not conform to the pattern of this world and help us all to live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you. Please stand as we continue to pray together. Father, out of the depths we cry to you that you would hear our prayer. Let your ears be attentive to our cries for mercy. Father in heaven, we confess today and always with sorrow that we have sinned and deserve only your anger and punishment. And if you kept a record of our sins, we would all surely be lost. But we confess with joy that your unfailing love has redeemed us. And our hope is in you and in your full redemption all around us, we see the pangs of the last days in war, famine, earthquakes, false prophets, and spiritual apathy. Use these signs to remind us that we do not know the day or hour when Christ will come again. But keep us faithful to your word and send your spirit to strengthen our faith so that we're always prepared for your son's return as judge. And then make us faithful in sharing your word and cause many more to put their hope in you, Lord, before the end comes build our fellowship here, the fellowship founded on your love, the fellowship of brothers and sisters in the faith, and help us support one another when trials and troubles come our way. 
Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions this morning. Heavenly Father, we eagerly wait for Jesus to come again and make all things new. May he find us whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, faithfully enduring to the end through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. And this morning, uh, being uh, Veterans Day weekend, uh, we have the privilege of bringing before our Father in heaven all those who do serve, and we, we thank God for all those who have served in keeping our nation and our country and our freedoms safe at such great a cost. So we pray at this time for our armed services. Almighty and merciful God, once again, we thank you for the freedom that we have through your son, Jesus Christ, that came at such a great price that Jesus, your son, was willing to give up his life and sacrifice to save ours. And on a day like today or a weekend as this, uh, Veterans Day weekend, we are only even more thankful and grateful as uh, we think about those who gave their lives and sacrificed uh, the ultimate sacrifice to give us the freedom and, and protect and strengthen the freedom we have here in America. Um, Lord, be with those uh, families who experienced loss. Be with those who experienced uh, pain and suffering through their service. Uh, and be with those who continue to serve uh, us. And Lord, keep them protected. And during the difficulties of their service, um, do not permit them to lose contact with you, but rather use uh, war and their service as a reminder and a, uh, a picture of your love and protection over all people. Um, and remind us, Lord, to keep uh, our military in, in prayer to you, Lord, that you would continue to give us uh, the freedoms that you've granted this nation. And help us to speak words of encouragement and thanks to those who serve, uh, that they may know that we're thankful to you as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name, uh, in whose name we continue to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth and protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Maybe seated for our closing hymn. 